Okay, um, warm, warm welcome from my side uh, to the fourth and last session of this great conference. I'm uh, pleased to moderate the panel on financial literacy, COVID, and uh, um, I would like uh, to introduce to you my panelists and the topic of uh, financial literacy, the different gender aspects and the potential impact of it, how to build personal resilience in times of crisis like COVID-19 have been recently. One of the few topics we would like to discuss today is how um, financial literacy can improve the well-being of the population. And we would like to debate the gender differences in and the measures the policymakers can take to improve the skills of the citizenship. Let me warm welcome on this panel together with me, Anna Maria Lusardi, professor at the George Washington University School of Business, founder and academic director of Global Financial Literacy Excellence Center. Angelika Zoma Hemmelsberger, member of the executive board of Austrian Control Bank. Joanne Young, program director of the University of South Carolina, Center of Economic and Social Research. Andrea Mechler, member of the governing board of the Swiss National Bank and Sylvia Klitzinger, professor at the University of Vienna, co-principal investigator at the um, Austrian National Election Study and the Austrian uh, panel, Corona Panel Project. So, before we go um, in depth, Anna Maria, may I start with you? Can you give us an insight on um, what do you think are the gender differences uh, in financial literacy. Thank you very much, Petya. Let me just start by saying it's very exciting to be here today to uh, the conference. Uh, I have tried to also attend some of the previous panel and uh, this is a, an amazing group of people. So very happy to be here today and talk about uh, the research. I, I have uh, prepared a short presentation, so let me start sharing it so it is easier to describe some of the points I am going to make. Um, and I know this is a short presentation, but I want to make three important points. One is that there is a stubborn and persistent gender difference in financial literacy. And this is what I am going to document today using the most recent data we have collected in January 2021. The second, and very much related to what you were saying earlier, is that uh, financial literacy matters, and therefore the gender gap matters. Financial literacy is linked to financial well-being, and that's why we need to worry when we see that there is this gender gap in financial literacy. And third, uh, these gaps start early as early as 15 years old. And this is why this data has implication for the policy and programs we can put in place to start filling, to start addressing this gender gap. So let me start showing some of the data. Since 2017, we have been collecting each year um, some information on knowledge on personal finance which includes, by the way, knowledge of inflation and inf includes some of the major and most basic concepts that we all need today to make financial decisions. And let me document right away that in the most recent survey, yet again, we find this gender difference in financial literacy. In other words, women are no less than men. And in this particularly uh, data set, they are able to answer less than half of the personal finance questions that we have asked. We have as many as 28 questions. And so when we look at the distribution also, we found that women, one in four, is not even able to uh, answer seven of these uh, questions. So there is a, a gender gap and there is a large group of women which have uh, little financial knowledge. Let me show you a, a striking result when we look deeper at the data. There are eight topics that we cover uh, in this personal finance index, and there is a gender difference in each single topic. In other words, when considering topics like uh, debt, inflation, risk diversification, women know less than men in each single topic. 
And unfortunately, knowledge is particularly low in the topic that are most important uh, during a pandemic, comprehending risk, insuring, investing. Now, um, why is it that women know less? Um, is it because they get these questions wrong? Uh, let me say that the way we design the questions, there are multiple choices. So women have a correct answer to the question, a set of incorrect answer, and they can also say, I do not know. And so when we zoom in, in the way in which women answer the question, in this survey, again, we confirm what has been a finding in many other studies, which is that disproportionately, women answer with, I do not know, to the questions. So it's not that women do not know perhaps this concept, but they are not sure 100% about this concept. And the knowledge is particularly low, again, in these topics that are so important now, investing, insuring, comprehending risk. So it's not just a matter of knowledge when it comes to women, it's also a matter of confidence. And I know this because in another paper, we were able to actually take away this do not know option and we force women to answer. And when we did so, we did see that women were able actually to answer correctly. So women know more than they think they know, but when we ask them how confident they are on their answer, they said they were not confident, even for relatively simple questions. So it is a matter of knowledge, but also confidence. And that's an important kind of fact I would like to highlight from the data. But coming to the second point, it matters. When we look at, for example, indicator of financial well-being, we find that women are financially less secure, less well than men on almost every indicators of financial well-being. So, for example, women have more difficulty making end meets. They cannot pay the bills on time. They lack emergency savings. They are not able to face an unexpected shock of $2,000 if uh, something uh, um, unexpected would happen and that prevent them from addressing financial priorities. And most importantly, there is a link to financial literacy in every single indicators. In other words, women which know more, they are less likely to suffer from these problems. So women which are more financially literate are more likely to be able to make ends meet, they can pay in full, they are less likely to be financially fragile. And these findings holds true if I, I account for all of the characteristics of women. So it's not because the women who are financially literate have higher income, higher educations, and other characteristics. You know, financial literacy has an effect above and beyond, for example, the effect just on education. So financial literacy is conducive to this uh, better uh, behavior. And on, uh, in, a, in a new paper, we have focused on one specific behavior, which is investing in the stock market. Um, and we focus on that because it is quintessential what we think about when we think of finance, right? It's investing in the stock market. What we found is that women are much less likely to invest in the stock market, but it is not because of lack of knowledge, it is also because of lack of confidence. As I was mentioning, this gender gap is composed of both knowledge and confidence, and both matters in terms of investing in the stock market. Women which have less knowledge and less confidence are less likely to invest in the stock market and therefore grow their wealth. We call this paper Fearless Woman because we were, of course, inspired by Fearless Girl, this statue that was put across from the raging bull in Wall Street. And it is interesting that they put a girl, not a woman, in front of uh, the raging bull. And they are right, because these gender differences start as early as 15. We have examined data from the OECD PISA Program for International Student Assessment. And when we look, for example, at my own country, Italy, we found a stark gender difference in financial literacy that starts at age 15. And I want to use the word stereotype 
because this is often what we see when we look at the data. And so this is why I think as we look at potential policy and program implication for this research, we have to think of how we can promote indeed um, more knowledge and confidence among girls starting as early as possible. And I would like to end with uh, the fact that more recently uh, we started and the government started a financial education committee. It uh, has started in 2017 and our focus has been in particularly on the young and more recently on women. And I'm actually showing the picture here where before the pandemic, we could meet with the president of the Republic, President Mattarella, and explain the work that we have been doing. I want to end by saying that focusing on vulnerable groups like women and investing in financial education will be the road to the recovery from this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna Maria. That was really very interesting insight. And um, I would like to pick up on one of your statements about the fearless woman and uh, come to Angelica with the question on it. Angelica, we have heard about the fearless woman and the lack of confidence in the financial decisions of women. And you are um, in your position on the board of one of uh, the biggest financial institutions in Austria. How do you see that? Is there um, evidence which you see in that direction or see differently? No, actually, I do see it quite uh, quite similar to uh, to Anna Maria because uh, we uh, did um, a study a study also in January. So I think we've got uh, quite recent data as well, and it seems that everything that Anna Maria just said is uh, is confirmed. So. Um, Maybe I, I would like to touch uh, in my short presentation on, on two points. And uh, yes, thank you very much, Katharina. Maybe go to the next one. I've got two points. The one is investing in the stock markets, just as Anna Maria just said. And the second is uh, developing a national financial literacy strategy in Austria. So I think Italy and Austria are doing quite the same things, or are we doing things similarly? And uh, let's compare notes maybe uh, after the presentations, what, what comes out. So maybe for the first point, investing in the stock market. Uh, uh, this is a survey that was commissioned by the Austrian Aktien Forum in, in January this year. And it was uh, a telephone and online survey uh, with about 1,000 respondents. So just for the, for the size of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the panel. And if we come to the next slide, please. Um, one of the questions that was asked was about the forms of investment. And uh, the focus that I want to, to put on is uh, less on, on the, the types of investment, but rather that there is a gender difference. Because you see the, the dark blue is the, uh, are the answers of the male respondents and the lighter blue, the, the, the lower line, is uh, th uh, that of the women. And generally speaking, the participation in the capital market in, in Austria is quite low. And from this, you can see that we still have a, uh, a gender difference and the participation of female, of, of women, uh, is still even lower than that. If we go to the next slide, um, and that's something that was, that basically echoes what uh, what Anna Maria said. So how do you rate the knowledge about investing in the stock exchange? And you can clearly see that uh, women are much, much less confident than men are. So we've got like 15, if it, on, the, on the bottom right hand side, if you've got 59 uh, uh, percent of the, the women say they're not good at all uh, what, concerning the knowledge. And that's for me, it's it's kind of shocking, but it's uh, I think it gives us uh, some some thing to do and financial literacy and and financial education is definitely uh, the thing that uh, we can come up with. But I think the general point is uh, you can see men are much more confident. They are much. Uh, yeah, they rate their knowledge a lot higher than than women do. Uh, on the next slide. Um, 
we asked to what extent do statements about participating in the stock market apply to you and this uh, are actually goes for the reasons uh, why respondents do not invest in the stock market. So the top answers are the lack of knowledge. Again, here we have it, uh, which is kind of paired with no interest in, in, in stocks. And then I would say the, the second and the third reason for not investing is, uh, well, the personal wealth is too, too small and fear of high losses. And the other is uh, confidence again. It's fear of picking the wrong stocks. It's fear of high losses. It's no feeling for risk and return and no trust in stock markets, which for me goes back to a lack of knowledge. Because if you know how things work, you feel more confident and you feel more familiar with things. And so you can uh, act a lot better. Um, then one slide, the next one. Uh, and, and actually the one after that as well, uh, go to the reasons or what has COVID changed in, in the perception of the stock market. And there you can see that uh, actually the perception of men to go more positive, that's the, the dark green uh, section on, in, in the line, uh, is a lot stronger than the one from the women. And in generally, I would say that um, I can also echo what uh, Anna Maria said with the I do not know answer, because you see on the on the bottom right hand side the I do not know answer from the women, how has this, uh, the view of the stock market changed is quite evident with 25% uh, uh, of the respondents answering that. How has investing and savior behavior changed uh, because of the pandemic? And I think that's uh, something that we have seen quite, uh, which is not only in Austria, but I think that's quite a global phenomenon uh, that uh, savings and uh, has, uh, well, uh, has uh, increased a lot. And here you can see quite a, uh, quite a disparity between women and men at least in, in the Austrian survey, that's uh, what came out, that, so that every second woman uh, spend, uh, saves more and spends less money, and every third man uh, from the respondent. And otherwise, I think it's, uh, yeah, because of the uh, pandemic and all the shops being closed and uh, no, no possibilities for tourism or all the, uh, the well, restaurants, I think it was easier to, it was a lot harder to spend the money. And that's why more went into savings. Uh, so the key findings from, from this study for me regarding gender related differences, because that was the, the only thing that I really picked out from, from the study, it has a lot more other questions, is that there are significant differences regarding investments in stocks and funds between men and women. Uh, and I think the most important point, women state a lack of knowledge and generally are more risk, not averse, but risk conscious, because referring to the, the panel that was just before this one, uh, there was a, a discussion between risk, uh, risk averse. And uh, I think it's, it's just they are more risk conscious because there is some more long term planning that comes into, into the focus. And uh, yeah, I think Corona has led to an enormous increase in savings uh, in, in savings behavior among the women. I think that's that's another point. So for the for the second point that I wanted to focus on in my presentation is uh, developing a national financial literacy strategy, and this goes back basically to uh, to May 2020 when the Austrian uh, government decided. Uh, it's time to have a national financial literacy strategy. And uh, there are actually two studies for that. One is based uh, on, on the question, where does Austria stand uh, internationally? So compared to other countries. And uh, actually we didn't come out that bad, uh, but there is still a lot of room to improve. 
And uh, if we, I, I just don't want to go into the details of this slide, but maybe we can skip to the, or go to the next one, because that's more the, the focus of what we are doing right now. Um, there was a report that came out of the of the first phase of of uh, developing the national financial literacy strategy, and uh, this was done in cooperation of the Federal Ministry of Finance in Austria, the European Commission, and the OECD. And uh, basically, its uh, its main purpose was to. Uh, put together to take stock of all the uh, financial literacy activities that there are in Austria, and there is a lot of them. And a lot of them is uncoordinated because it's done by many different stakeholders. And uh, one of the main goals of, of the study was to uh, put together a map and do all the, all the activities there are and all the stakeholders and then provide a basis for, for the way to go forward and uh, how to best uh, consolidate and coordinate the efforts. So the, the key findings from this report was, so build on stakeholder involvement for an effective, effective and efficient coordination. So uh, it's pool your resources and uh, don't, uh, don't invent the wheel like, like it was said every time and like it was also said before. Uh, it makes sense to target uh, the audiences based on evidence and policy priorities. Uh, basically, at the moment, a lot of financial education is targeted at young people from uh, beginning from the sc uh, school. And uh, once uh, um, the person leaves school, there is hardly anything afterwards. So it makes sense to, to target uh, the different uh, groups uh, uh, separately and, and specifically, and also target women specifically, because uh, uh, that's something that was uh, evident in, in, all the, in all the surveys and studies and uh, that uh, women are less strong in financial literacy than men are. Let's put it this way. Uh, there might also be uh, the, uh, the issue of uh, addressing the general population through a comprehensive approach. So make heightened awareness of this, uh, of, of this topic uh, and address all the areas that underpin financial well-being, which means coming from budgeting to spending to saving to taking out loans to knowing what you're doing. Uh, so I think it's very much, uh, very much the whole range of topics that, that should be covered. And uh, the last point that's on there, encourage, encourage research and program evaluation, uh, means that if you want to uh, evaluate, which is highly, uh, highly, um, highly necessary, because otherwise you, you don't know whether, you're the, whether your measures are on target and whether you achieve anything. I think for that, it, there has to be some structure and there has to be a common uh, definition. And I think that makes it much easier uh, to, uh, to prove what you're doing. And I just want to, to end by emphasizing that I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that increased uh, financial literacy, literacy will support the well-being of everybody. And I think there is still a lot of room for improvement uh, on, in financial education fa and financial literacy uh, for all different kinds of tar target groups, among them women. And I think it's also uh, one point of kind of reinforcing gender equality uh, is uh, definitely a challenge, but one that we have to tackle. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Angelica. This was uh, really a very interesting presentation and uh, thank you for making the point on the national strategy. I think that's uh, a very important uh, policy recommendation and uh, 
I would like to come back to that. Uh, at uh, the end of the presentations, while starting our question and answer session. But just to um, count the um, observations so far and the points to pick up on. So um, obviously women are more vulnerable to crisis as men. They do have less savings and uh, less uh, financial cushions to react on crisis situations. At the same time, there is not maybe not that big issue of uh, uh, education, but for sure issue on um, confidence, which women have uh, compared to men. And uh, we see that their financial decisions are very much driven by that. Through the crisis, there is a caretaker effect and women are uh, starting to save more than invest with 48%, if I recall uh, correctly, the numbers you gave us. Um, these are quite uh, uh, hard facts here. Let us see whether on the other side of the world uh, we do have the same observations. Joanne, um, I would like to come to you. Uh, you have uh, conducted several studies and also several evaluations of financial education. Can you share with us the evidence you have and whether you resonate with the points Anna Maria and Angelica have made so far? Joanne, I guess uh, we have uh, your mic is not on. That's the favorite word of the year. Please unmute. Um, um. I'm not sure that you hear me. I guess your uh, mic is still on mute. Ah, yeah, you hear me. Perfect. Hi, Petia. I'm so sorry. We had a little bit of a of a of a trouble with the uh, with the internet here. I'm so sorry. That is the nature of the modern world today. My apologies. Uh, can you see the screen? Am I able to actually share the screen? Ah, yes. Thank you so much. Just give me a second. Um, Thank you for having me today. And as you did mention, I'm speaking to you today from Singapore. I'm with the University of Southern California, but I have been based here in Asia for the last few years doing evaluations of financial education programs. And I wanted to say that a lot of what I will be speaking about in the next 10 minutes absolutely resonates perfectly with what we've heard in the sessions before, as well as with the observations with the panelists before me. I wanna echo very much that we see the same trends here in Asia that we see in Europe and elsewhere, where the gender gap for men and women remains um, unfortunately very challenging, despite a lot of the demographic changes and progress that we've seen in other areas. I wanna start by sharing some of these observations, but also talking about some of the insights that we have from specific programs that we've evaluated, and maybe speak a little bit about how financial education really helps to bridge the gender gap, but a consciousness of how this works perhaps specifically for women and the social context of women is so important to making it really work. And so what I'd like to first share is if we look at coming back, I think, to what Anna said, is really to reflect again that when we look at young people, and these are the PISA results that Anna Maria referenced in her talk, really we see that this gap in financial literacy emerges very early on. But what's very, very striking is that when we look at the unconditional differences in financial literacy between girls and boys across all of these countries around the world, we actually don't see that much of a difference at age 15. But when we take into account the fact that one of the things girls do at this age is they are much more competent at reading and comprehension, and in some areas a little bit uh, plus and minus with respect to the mathematics, when we take into account girls' inherent abilities, then we see that gap start to emerge. So conditional on the fact that girls are as competent or more competent than boys, they still in the area of finance itself appear to be behind. And so it doesn't seem to be tied to our core capabilities on the skills of mathematics and language, but something related to our exposure to the field of finance that again starts at the age of 15 or before. And what that means again very much is that financial education specifically outside the curriculum of reading and writing is something that needs to be started at a very early age because these exposures are not happening in the schools. But on that foundation of financial education, 
question, coming back, I think, to the other observation, is that very often we have a good idea of how to start within the school system because there's a structure. But once girls and boys leave school, that landscape becomes very empty. And so engaging with financial education for adults has been very challenging. And one of the things that we've talked a lot about is how we can do this with the workplace. But we also know that the workplace is not an equal environment. And one of the great challenges that we face is what do we do in the community setting for older women for whom this gap has been enshrined for the entire lifetimes and for whom the social setting in which they work has been stacked against them for literally generations. And very often, again, this has been the massive challenge for us because we feel that something must be done, but it's not an easy path forward. And so what I'd like to talk about today, actually, is how we've dealt with this in Singapore in a program of study that we have been studying that seems very promising and the approach that has been taken to address this. So Singapore, in many ways, um, is a country that is a model for states of education. Our PISA scores are legendarily very high. We have actually perfect gender balance in the high school age. But when we look at older women, we find actually that the disparity in education and financial literacy actually is as strong as any other country. And when we look at men and women in the S&P financial literacy survey, 67% of men are financially literate and only just over half of women. This is not only a striking gap in and of itself, but it is three times the global average. Now, again, it's very challenging for us because Singapore is a very small country. But at the same time, these are women who are a lot of the women that we speak of here are older. They're already out of the labor force. It's not as if there's an easy way for us to reach them through an employment based program. And as been mentioned, community education is very challenging. So the program that I want to share with you a little bit about today and these results again are very new. We actually we literally I think just completed this paper is a program that was developed by a local foundation, the city uh, the South Foundation using a curriculum from the city foundation. And it's a 12 week program for older women in particular. And the very striking thing I would like to tell you about this program was that it was run 10 years ago. This program began in 2008. It brought women in community centers together in small groups. And in those groups, they would learn not just the basics of finance, but they would also learn social skills. They would learn negotiation skills. They would conversation skills about how to talk to a financial advisor and very importantly, how to talk to their own family members about finance. And one of the striking things I once heard Anna Maria Lusadi say many years ago, among the many striking things she has said is, what do we expect from a one hour program, even a one week program? Why do we expect that to transform people's lives? Is that too much for us to ask? And what's the sustainability of financial education programs? And that was a question we wanted to ask from this 12 week program. We had early evaluations from this program that showed that women that came through it were very positively inclined. They were making financial plans. They had gone to try to change their behavior. But the very ambitious thing that we wanted to ask was, if we go back to them 10 years later with a rigorous study, will we see effects? And more importantly, if we go back to them now during the COVID pandemic, what will we learn about whether or not this program affected their resilience? And so we went back to the 1,200 women who were enrolled in this program and we contacted randomly 200 of them and we found a matched comparison from women who had gone through other programs, other community-based programs. Um, and we matched them on demographics and we asked them the same questions about their financial behavior and their financial knowledge. And this is what we found. In the group of women who had had financial education, again, 10 years ago, we found that they were much more likely on the very famous Lusadi and Mitchell questions to do better. They were more likely to understand interest compounding. They were slightly more likely to understand inflation and they were less likely to say, I don't know. When we asked them qualitatively as well, what they took away from the program, some of them said, well, we know we can't remember the specifics, but we remember concepts. So for example, they were able to describe insurance as an umbrella. Even if they couldn't describe the specifics of an insurance policy, they had a very clear understanding of conceptually what that meant. We have a ton of metrics about their behavior, but I want to share a very important finding here that when we ask them again, what, what they do financially, we find that many more of them keep track of their expenses, have a budget, have savings that they know about and have higher knowledge of their and investments and their loans. And what I want to point to here is not just the difference between I don't know, which you can see here is very stark, 
the light lines are the people who have been in the program. The dark lines are the people who are in the match comparison group. The people who are in the match comparison group are much more likely to say, I don't know about keeping track of their expenses and knowing the value of their own financial assets. And this is actually, again, very striking for us because in Singapore, we have what we call a compulsory retirement savings program. So everyone has a savings account. But when we look at the behavior of women who are in the financial education program, they're more self-aware of what's going on in that program. And they are more mindful about their behaviors. As you can see here, when we ask them about the understanding of their investments, they're much more likely to have a good understanding of the investments, much less likely to say, again, I don't know. And when it comes to understanding what they themselves are holding, which is a measure of empowerment, they're much more likely to say, I know the value of my own investments. And again, that's a sign that they're actively engaging with their portfolios. Coming back to the idea of resilience, as you can see here, they're much more likely to also say they have an emergency fund relative, to, and again, the I don't know is also a striking feature here. And they're also much more likely to say that if they had an emergency, they would be able to borrow money and raise that money quickly. Now, these differences are very striking. What I would like to share here relative to this panel is what they say when we ask them about how they're coping with COVID-19. And what I've done here is color the responses. Um, again, on the left, you see the people in the financial education program and on the right, the match comparison group. And the red bar at the bottom are the people who say that they are not coping well at all. And they say, I don't know what I need to do to cope well. And as you can see, that category is very much larger among our match comparison group. But in the green category, the other thing I would like to point out is that the green category are people who say that they are coping well. And on an absolute number, that's larger for the people in the financial education group. But also, the fraction of women in the financial education group who say, I'm coping well because I have found new ways to cope and I am actively looking for ways to cope. Again, mindful engagement with their finances is also very much higher. Now, I want to make my last point here, which is that I want to explain why it is um, that this program worked and what is the answer about for making financial literacy work for women. And the answer is women. So when we went back to the study, this was a mixed method study. So we did the survey, we did the match analysis, and then we also did very in-depth focus groups and discussion groups. And what women told us was that the thing that made this program last was that it was not 12 weeks 10 years ago that the women who went through this 12 week program continued to interact with each other. And the program encouraged this by having alumni meetings and that most of these women formed WhatsApp groups. And they would say to us that in their normal peer groups, they were embarrassed to talk about money. Even within their families, they couldn't speak about money, but that this program gave them a peer group within whom any question about finance was open. They could discuss freely and frankly, and they had a continuous stream of self-education for 10 years. And that they felt, again, coming back to this question of fearless girl, they felt fearless within those groups to talk about finance, something that in an Asian context, and I believe in other contexts as well, is often not a topic of public discussion. And so for them, the key ingredient they reiterated to us was not that the curriculum was amazing or was there was top quality or they really learned financial concepts to be a wizard of portfolio manipulation. It was that it gave them these tools to interact socially on finance and to educate themselves on an ongoing basis about finance. And I'd also just like to finish off by saying that it's absolutely true. I want to reinforce again the idea that not only do this, uh, is the social function so important for women in learning and continuing to grapple with finance, that when we educate women, they also give back. Uh, and what we can see is that women who go through our programs are much more likely to be asked to be a caregiver for another family member. So when we build up the financial stability of women, we also create a stronger safety net for their families and for society. Last but not least, um, this I think is the what made us most happy. When we asked the women in our group versus the women in our match comparison group about their well-being, ultimately at the end of the day, and this is a question actually that features in many other financial surveys, Women who are in our group, regardless of their financial status, feel calmer. They feel more confident. They feel more in control. They have less anxiety even going through the pandemic stage, and they feel like they are in charge. Uh, we can't control our environment. I think that's what COVID has told us. I can barely control my internet, really, at this point in time. 
So what, what the women do tell us is that what we have now is a structure that whatever happens to the world, whatever changes, because in Singapore, our retirement uh, savings uh, structure changes all the time. I have a constant, which is a social space, which makes finance something that I am not afraid of, and I have the tools to manage. So the three things I think I'd just like to leave you with, with this presentation is number one, financial education is not a cold construct that happens in schools and then at the end of the day goes nowhere. And it's also not the case that once women have not had financial education their whole life long, that there's nothing we can do because we can look to financial education to empower them. Second, when we empower women through financial education, it's not just about knowing the facts or how to manipulate numbers. It's about being mindful, being self-aware, and having the ability to actually grapple with the realities of finance, and it leads them to be more resilient. And the last but not least, I really want to sort of come back to the idea that finance, again, for women, they learn better when it is connected to their social environment in a very crucial way, and they give back in a very social way. And so it's not finance, it's not something that is siloed off from the social context. Again, and I think that's why we're here talking about gender and finance. It's something that works best when we really step back and we see it against the context of well being. But financial education can work, it does work. And I'm very excited actually with these results. We are actually going to be studying how to bring this program to other countries as well. And hopefully in the future, I'll be able to speak to other people about this in, in settings other than Asia to see if this result holds in other societies also. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Joanne. That was really insightful. And um, I really like the point that financial education is not only about the schools, but also about different um, different parts of the society and different ages. So possibly talking about national strategy that should be emphasized on that uh, different uh, stages of life when you can conduct financial education and make a comprehensive package. But um, coming further in that discussion, I would like to pick up on your statement that women who are financially literate, they evaluate differently um, their economic situation, they can track better their expenses and know better what are their savings about. Uh, and come to Andrea and ask her, Andrea, from the perspective of a central bank, do you see evidence uh, that uh, there are gender differences on the economic perception and um, in particularly on the um, COVID crisis as such? Let me unmute myself. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be happy to answer this question. I must say what I have heard in Joanne, this is just amazing because I've been thinking and you'll see, I'll come to some of the similar results that uh, that uh, um, Angelica and Anna Maria had found that um, in the end, a lot of it is about confidence gap. And I was thinking, yeah, but how, what do we do about it? And I wonder whether what you just said, Joanne, is, 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 is a puzzle to, is a piece of the puzzle to go closer and how do we overcome that confidence gap. So really wonderful. It's a pleasure for me to be here in a very distinguished group. So I'm going to take a, a view of a central bank. So if you could show me this, if you could bring up the slides, that would be great. And the first slide, um, I'm not going to apologize for it, but it's a very central banking slide, but you'll see why I bring it. Because the first thing I'm, I'm going to talk about three topics, inflation and whether an inflation perception there is a gender difference. I'm going to talk about financial literacy and I'm going to talk about the COVID and unemployment. Uh, it, have we seen in Switzerland an employment gap? So this is a very central bankish um, slide, but since um, I thought it might be interesting, although you probably all know it, right? The mandate of a central bank, we, we often have several, but in, the most important is about price stability. And, and the question is price stability, we all know what it, well, you know, price stability, the way we think about it is uh, CPI is the consumer price index shouldn't grow more than, in our case, 2% per year. Now, how do we, how do we, so we have tools, we have interest rates, um, we have now unconventional tools. In the case of Switzerland, we even use intervention on the, on the, uh, on the FX market. There are different tools to bring financial stability, but ultimately, one of the most important requirements that we have in order to bring stability in prices is that 
the inflation, the perception that people have about price dynamics matters. And not only the, the perception of the price dynamics today, but the perception or the expectation of how prices are going to behave in the next 12 months is of incredible importance because that is what creates the anchor, a nominal anchor. This is what helps firms decide how much uh, how to set up the wages. This is or the prices of the goods. This is what helps consumers decide when to buy something, when to do you postpone your purchase? Do you purchase something now? This is what uh, induces savers to think, um, how much should I uh, set aside depending on how much, what is my purchasing power that I'm going to have at the end of the year or even over a longer time period. Now, what is interesting is that inflation per perception is incredibly important for central banks. Um, it is what provides our credibility Right is uh, is ultimately we need to have inflation expectations that ground what people expect price where what people expect prices to be, and on the other hand, uh, so so if we get it right, we have a higher credibility. But the higher cred credibility is also what's going to make sure that people create the anchor of the price expectation where we want it to be. So it's an incredibly dynamic point, but ultimately it, re it, it is based on what people, do people think central banks are going to be doing a good job? And do people think the prices are going to stay where the central bank wants it to remain? So now this is incredibly important. It is complex. It's not, um, it's often difficult to track. But so the question here is, do, is there a difference in how women and men perceive inflation? So let me go to the next slide, please. And the answer is yes. Women appear to have a systematically higher inflation perception, not only perception, but also um, expectation than men. So what you see here, and this is for Switzerland, so this is a, a little bit older, 2016, what we see here is that on the first set of, uh, of the, set, the first columns is um, you see that the, the that perception, the way people perceive inflation to be today is higher than what they expect inflation to be in 12 months. So there seems to be the prices today seem to be slightly higher than yesterday. But overall, over a 12 month period or even a, a two, two year period, then they do expect inflation, but to be a little bit lower. Now, what is interesting is how does that difference between the perception of inflation of, to, of the price dynamics today and the expectation of how this dynamics is going to evolve over time is different between men and women. And this is what I show in the, in the following two bar, bar, bar charts. So you see both, in both cases, women perceive and expect inflation dynamics to be higher. And now the difference and why is that? And that is when it becomes difficult. So one, one, uh, the, the several explanations. One is shopping habits, um, is that women tend to do the grocery shopping uh, and, and women tend to do, to do more of the shopping on the prices which are picked up in inflation. And so they may be, and that's one, one interpretation, overly sensitive or more sensitive to price changes than men. They may also have to deal with tighter budgets. They have to put the budget together. So a slight change even in the price of milk may have really a direct impact where they say, oh no, goods are really more expensive today than they were yesterday. Another reason is that women may buy different types of goods. As I say, usually it's more grocery shopping, whereas men may buy more historically talking, and this is about Switzerland, uh, the bigger items, men tend to buy the bigger items, and there the difference in prices is, is lower, and, and in the bigger items you have the quality uh, characteristics that come into place. You may, it may cost more to buy a car or, or electrical uh, appliance, but for at least, or a computer, but you get a higher quality for it. And therefore it doesn't feel to be that much more expensive. But the thing is, is that when you look into, so, but when you look closer into it, it's not that clear. Why? 
because they've they've looked they've tried to differentiate do we see the same the same type of gap if we differentiate um, single female households and single male households so where the men have to do just as much grocery shopping as the women and there the gap this seems to disappear. Another thing that has been done is to differentiate periods where food prices were stable, where food prices were low and stable, and, and there the gap, uh, actually there the gap stayed. So it was very clear that, 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 that the gap remains for women and men. Now, going further, what, so there was many questions, different, different ways of looking at it. But there I come back to the same explanation that we've had. All of this, you could find the gap in these different things, but the gap totally disappeared once you took into account financial literacy. Uh, once economic, financial, economic literacy was controlled for, the gap completely disappeared. So let me go, um, let me go one slide further, please. So this is why, and, and this is just, so this might be good for the discussion later on, what do we do about financial literacy? So just as a little feedback, so we do not have in Switzerland a national financial literacy strategy, but the SNB has launched since 2007, a program of financial literacy. And it is a program that uh, it's called economics, it's web-based, it's done in three languages. In fact, the, the programs can be downloaded in four languages because, as you know, in Switzerland, we have three official languages, German, English, and Italian. And we also have most courses, most um, uh, 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 material also available in English. And, and the target group are the young adults. So it's 15 to 20 years old. It's just pre-university, and it's kind of the... Uh, 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 it's the upper secondary level, uh, not necessarily the ones who are going to university, but all of the other ones, including the, the ones who do apprenticeship and so on. And it is done in a more, uh, in a more uh, playful way. It's a lot of educational games, it's simulation, it's case studies, and it is really used, and the, the idea is to have this um, the material that can be online, it can be also uh, paper-based, and that is basically supporting the teachers of economics and humanities to provide interesting um, material to the students to engage them in this kind of uh, subjects. So it offers about 100 teaching uh, uh, units, I, I mentioned it in different languages, now, we do not, in those programs, we do not uh, focus on girls or women. Um, but it is interesting, sometimes we do see changes. So if the game theory, um, you know, gaming in general, you, you'll see there's a gender difference in the interest. Um, but, but the idea is to have it really open for uh, everybody. Um, let me now, so this is, so this is a program we've had 2007. The SNB is fully funded by the central bank. It is it is open for the for the teachers, uh, but we it's it's uh, uh, we do not we do not control necessarily what is on there. So we have people. Uh, it's it's run uh, at a hands on. We, we we discuss. We provide. We help to provide uh, new topics but it's also run independently. So let me see what happens to literacy gap in, in Switzerland. So let's go to the next slide. So in here I see, I find exactly the same result that we've had in the previous uh, presentation. Here it's done in a much more simpler way and it's based on, on, on different papers, empirical papers, I'm just showing the key results. And the key results is if you look at the standard big three questions on financial literacy, you see a big difference between men and women. But most of this difference, or this difference completely disappears once you take out the do not know or refuse. And this is why we come to the same conclusion, half of the literacy gap is not a financial literacy gap, it is a confidence gap. So this it would be interesting, but clearly, uh, and, and just to, to give you a sense, uh, I know these things are very difficult to compare across uh, countries and uh, 
especially when I've seen what Austria does and some in, in, in Singapore, Switzerland does not fare badly generally in financial literacy, or at least very similar to Austria or Germany, but in the end we're not we're not uh, we're not that high either. So let me so but I think and this is to me this was striking is how do you overcome that confidence gap, because to me that confidence gap is known only on financial literacy, but it also comes to question who applies to jobs at the central bank, who applies to jobs in the financial market, um, and, and how do we overcome this? So let me go to my third topic. The third topic is a little bit more about what happened during the COVID crisis, and where do we see gender gaps there? And there I thought it was interesting because I have a little bit of a counterintuitive result. Uh, in the sense that during the COVID crisis, we do not see a major gender gap, at least not if measured in terms of unemployment. Don't get me wrong, um, all the things about it's, the, it's, it's usually the women who've had to, to, to tend to the children at home while there was homeschooling. Um, we see a lot, of, a lot of these issues are definitely true in Switzerland, but in terms of pure unemployment, that is not something you see. This is what you see here on the, on the, on the left-hand side. The red line is the total unemployment. It went from around 2.5% before the crisis to 33 uh, today. And you see the yellow uh, line is, uh, are, the, um, are the women and the blue are the men. And you see this very similar pattern. In fact, the men unemployment historically is more volatile than the men. I have another graph to show it. So this is not something I would put too much, try to interpret too in detail. The issue is data are difficult to interpret because in Switzerland, the one, um, the one program that worked beautifully during the COVID crisis is the short time uh, program, is this ability for uh, companies to provide workers for short time work and, and yet they were paid um, almost a full amount by the government, and it allowed them not to be laid off, but to continue. And that is, I find interesting, because so you see the statistics on the right-hand side. I gave you a longer time statistics just to get a sense how big and how important that measure, that program has been. Historically, if you look at the 2008-2009, the global financial crisis, um, or 11 and 12, there was, you know, there was use of that program, but nothing even close to the dimension that, has, that it has been used now. Currently, there's still about a third, every third uh, employee makes use of that program. Unfortunately, right now, there is no detail on the gender specific. So I cannot tell you whether women or men have made more use of the of the short time work, so so there's been no gender specific unemployment trend. But I do I cannot tell you at this point um, to what extent the short time working has affected uh, men or women differently. Now I come to my I believe my last slide. It's a little bit more into the, uh, the, the labor market because in the end, labor market is very important when you think about gender differences. So what you see in Switzerland, let me just walk you through some characteristics so you get a little bit of difference. So the fact that there are no big differences in the male and female representation in unemployment. So let me just walk you quickly through these two uh, panels. If I start with the left-hand side, what you see here is the amount of men versus women that are employed in the industrial sector. What you see is the clearly way more men. So there's a big gender gap of where women versus men are employed. Industrial sector, much more male dominant. I can even call it dominated if you look at the numbers. But if you look at the unemployment rate, it's not clear. It follows very much the same pattern. So there doesn't seem to be a gap in terms of who gets laid off first. And the same thing in the service sector, whereas there you see that women in red, are the, the more women that are employed in the service sector than men, just by a little bit, but here as well, you do not see a very clear gender specific pattern when people are being laid off or who gets to be employed first, whether it's men or women, that seems 
to reflect much more the share of unemployment, the share of employment, the underlying share of employment of women and men. I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. I think what is interesting is that we are all aware in, in the field of economics and in the community of central banks that the gender differences have been tremendous during the COVID crisis. So in no way, please look at these numbers in me trying to say that there has not been uh, a very different burden on women than men through the crisis. But I think it has also uh, forced us to look with great humility what kind of data is available. Do we have the right data to answer the kind of question we ought to answer, to really get a good sense? And I think that there, Switzerland has never been data rich. Uh, but I think even looking at it from this perspective, very quickly you come to some uh, uh, limitation in terms of available data. Now, Publicly available data doesn't mean it's not available and it doesn't mean it will be, I'm, I'm in confidence, it will eventually be used also in the academic world, but it is striking to see in my, at least there was something for me, is that uh, we, the first thing we ought to do is make sure we collect the right data to be really able to do the kind of analysis that we need to, to fully understand the dynamics that are behind these patterns. Uh, I believe this is it, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. That was really insightful. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to pick up uh, on the topic of the different perceptions of economic reality. And before we move to the uh, policy recommendations, I would like to ask Sylvia for um, her view, uh, last but not least, are there gender differences uh, when people assess economical reality and uh, if there is an, uh, such evidence uh, from uh, your work or even from the Austrian Corona Panel project you are doing? Sylvia. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for introducing me and also thank you for um, inviting me to this interesting conference and this interesting panel. I try to share Yes, it seems to work. Okay, do you see my slides? No, we don't see it yet. Okay, it might take a while because my internet connection is not great. Do you see it now? Not yet. No, but we will manage them for you if uh, you don't mind. Our team will start them in a second. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, now we see them. You see them, right? Okay, so now, now that's... Okay, so I'm still in the position to somehow manage my slides. I think it takes just a while because of my uh, yeah. poor internet connection. Well, um, I should probably start by saying that I'm not an economist, but actually I'm a political scientist. But um, um, I was listening to your presentation with great interest because uh, whatever I'm going to uh, present to you in the next couple of minutes, you will see that there is a lot of overlap uh, from my discipline with your discipline. So that uh, while you were presenting uh, now, I changed the title of my presentation very quickly saying that this is actually a presentation about a general knowledge gap that we might see uh, between the genders. Because what I'm going to tell you uh, about is the knowledge gap when it comes to political literacy, to political knowledge. And you will see that most of the results that I'm going to present to you are almost identical to the results that you obtained when looking into financial literacy. So let me start by uh, first outlining the same issue as you did in the sense of why do we actually care in our discipline about political knowledge? about political literacy and the differences between the genders. And of course, in our discipline, uh, political literacy is important because of democratic skills. We live, in a liberal, we live in liberal democracies. We want citizens to participate. We want citizens to make a meaningful choice when turning out to vote. And these are the democratic skills which are of importance to us and also to a democratic society. And the two democratic skills that we're looking into it 
are first of all participation and we are knowing from our literature that uh, whether people do turn out to vote has a lot to do whether people are knowledgeable, whether they have the right political literacy. And it's not only the turnout that is important uh, uh, in that respect, but it's also this unconventional form of participation that we see that is very much tied to political knowledge. And what do I mean by um, unconventional form of participation? Simple things like boycotting, uh, signing a petition or participating in demonstration. And we do see a gender difference, both in turnout as well as in um, these unconventional forms of participation. Then there is a second democratic skill, which is of importance, namely the vote choice. And there, again, accountability is a very important term, a very important um, concept that we're looking into it. Because electoral democracies do work uh, with a certain accountability perspective, in the sense that on election day, voters have the possibility to vote into office a uh, party, a politician, or to vote out a party uh, and a, poli a politician um, of the office. And uh, what people normally do, or voters normally do, this is what we know from our research, is that they take the economic conditions of their country into account in order to hold their parties, to hold the government accountable. And so if the economic conditions are evaluated positively, then it's very likely that the parties are rewarded. When, however, the economic conditions are uh, evalu evaluated negatively, then they are thrown out of the office, they are uh, punished in the sense that they throw the rascals out. This is how we call it in the literature. So in both of these very important democratic skills aspects, um, knowledge is important uh, in general about the political system. And when it comes to accountability, even the economic knowledge is important so that the economic perceptions on how the economy is actually working, what the economy is doing for uh, the personal well-being is important for people being able to hold their res uh, representatives accountable in the sense of rewarding or punishing them. So as we know that there is a gender gap with regards to these democratic skills, that, um, this is then also reflecting negatively on uh, the uh, two important skills that we're looking at. What are the explanations for that? Well, there are a lot of explanations and uh, uh, the previous speakers have already um, hinted at a couple of issues which are of importance in their field. And you will see these are not so much different in the, diff in the field of political science. First of all, there are the uh, social norms. The social norms that we have towards what women do and what men should do. And we have the social norm that women should be there for parenting they should really be, uh, they, have, they have more responsibility for caring activities. So these are the social norms. And just to show you that I'm not making up that these are social norms uh, that we might reflect upon in this panel, I show you data from the European Values Survey from 1990 to 2018. These are data for Austria. Of course, we do uh, see country differences, but this is the Austrian data. And you see here, there are uh, two items that we asked in the European Value Survey from in each of those waves from 1990 onwards until 2018. And you see, of course, that uh, the gender roles, the perception of what gender, what women should do has changed quite a bit in those uh, almost 30 years. So nowadays it's only 53% uh, of people saying that children suffer if mothers work or it's only 40% of a respondent saying that what women really want is to have children and stay at home. So, but still, now we can discuss a lot about whether 40 and 53% is a lot or actually is okay-ish. I leave that to you. I have a very clear opinion on that, um, that um, there is uh, still quite a lot of um, things. There are still a lot of uh, gender roles, traditional gender roles going on. And if you then look into the two items on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, these are items that we only asked in 2018, you see that there is still a very, let's say, traditional conception, perception of uh, what women should do and what men should do, namely that men should earn money and women should stay at home and care, take care of the family. These are 32% of people uh, saying that. 
and um, if you look into the right hand side then it's um, um it's sorry i don't see it right now but it's over 60 percent saying that the family life suffers if women are working full-time okay part-time is okay full-time that's really bad for uh, the family issue if you now say well this is an issue that uh, mostly uh, concerns men i have to tell you that this is not true but believe it or not it's uh, women who actually um, are most likely um, agreeing to those items, namely that family life suffers, that children suffer and so on. Of course, we do not know what the chicken um, egg problem is here, that uh, these social norms are so enshrined that women believe it as much and therefore also uh, say, um, uh, uh, communicate it like that. But this is really interesting uh, to observe in that respect. Okay, let me now move on to the other explanations that we find in the literature on political knowledge. Of course, there are the usual suspects about the socioeconomic disadvantages, disadvantages that women do have, namely that women do have less resources and therefore they do have less time, less uh, money, less uh, resources in general to simply get knowledgeable about politics, about political system, elections and so on. But that's not the whole story, but we also have a lot of measurement issues with regards to uh, these gender gaps. And this is actually reflecting very nicely to what we have heard in the previous panel, namely how, we, how do we measure, how we do measure knowledge in, in general. And uh, we tend to forget that, of course, women and men go through diverse life experiences. And therefore, these different life experiences lead to um, a different way of acquiring knowledge. And this is, of course, also then affecting the type of knowledge that uh, women do hold and men do hold. Um, and the majority of those uh, questions that we normally ask about um, political systems, and I would not know whether the same thing is about financial issues, but for political aspects for sure, I do know that, that the majority of questions we ask do tend to ignore these gender differences in the life experiences of acquiring knowledge. And the questions are very much biased towards the man's interest, this factual knowledge, the reproduction of factual knowledge, and to a lesser degree, the, 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 the understanding of certain aspects without actually being able to provide the exact factual information on some of the questions that we do have. And now we're coming to something that has already been mentioned about the don't know answers before. We see the same pattern uh, when we come to political knowledge as such. And we have experiments there which uh, show actually that uh, once you do not provide the don't know answer to the, um, uh, to the respondents any longer, then all this hidden knowledge that women actually do have comes to the fore. They all of a sudden are much more likely to uh, answer questions correctly. This is exactly what Anna Maria showed in her presentation as well. And on the other hand, we could also show in these experiments uh, in political science is that uh, this uh, not providing the don't know answers also uh, brings to the fore that men very often do guess. So therefore they do not know it either, but they guess. They are not moving into the don't know um, answers, but they simply guess and therefore it seems that they are more knowledgeable. So with regards to um, measurement, there is definitely something to do. And I just want to show you, unfortunately, a, a couple of uh, things are in German here. We asked um, in uh, a survey amongst uh, young citizens uh, aged 16 to 20, because we have a voting at 16 in Austria, we asked them a couple of uh, factual knowledge on the political system. And 48% um, of women were able, of these young girls actually were able to answer all questions correctly. And 46% of the young boys were able to answer all these uh, questions correctly. So you would say, actually, not that much of a gender difference there. But when it comes then to confidence, we see the same thing as you uh, showed before in the presentations, namely that young women, even though they are knowledgeable, they are not confident about their knowledge in politics. And you see the complete different um, uh, behavior, this whole complete different confidence when it comes to young men, namely they are confident, but they know as, exactly as much as young women do know, but still in the conference, 
they do differ. So what you do? We have talked about confidence boost already quite a lot uh, in the previous dis uh, discussion. And actually, when it comes to political knowledge, there is experimental uh, evidence that shows that uh, indeed, uh, if there is deliberation going on in the sense that it's not about only um, um, uh, teaching um, about politics, but really deliberating about this issue with young uh, women, this helps them really to become more confident and therefore also to feel more comfortable when answering questions about uh, political systems. Um, of course, there is the usual suspect in there that we say that gender-friendly socialization during childhood is important, which also goes very nicely together with this age difference uh, after the age of 15. Um, that uh, we know from several research uh, that there is very traditional family values that are transported in the socialization of uh, young women. We have to rethink our measures. We have also to consider the different life experiences and therefore also probably think about uh, how we measure uh, knowledge in the future. And of course, we also have to review socioeconomic disadvantages uh, that are we know uh, that there are quite a lot of gender differences. And with that, I just wanted to show you one last thing that we collected in the Austin Corona Panel project that these socioeconomic disadvantages are really important to tackle because um, we asked them starting from March 2020 to April 2021, um, how much they feel endangered personally uh, by the economic uh, changes uh, due to COVID and how much they think that the Austrian economy is endangered uh, by COVID-19. And you see here exactly uh, what fits very nicely to the previous uh, presentation that women do feel much more economically endangered uh, than men do. And they also see a more a bigger danger for the entire uh, economic situation in Austria, which probably also explains to a larger extent why their savings have gone up, um, because they just see themselves to be a much more vulnerable group within the economic society than men are. Okay, with this, I leave it. Thank you for your attention. Looking forward to questions. Thank you very much, uh, Silvia. That uh, that was great. I think um, for me, that personally brought the topic back to the policy recommendations and uh, um, what that means uh, by implementing uh, financial literacy measures. So just to summarize, um, I have learned uh, from the last contributions of Andrea and Silvia that Actually, there is also an evidence that uh, um, women and men, the different genders, perceive economic reality differently. And obviously, female citizens overestimate the danger, uh, an economical danger, either inflation or a COVID crisis of the reality they live in. But um, the financial literacy skills of those are not just uh, uh, isolated, that they should not be tackled isolated. They are part of a bigger uh, context, and that's the democratic skills. So while we are uh, talking about recommendations on the policy side to implement financial literacy, we are actually talking about uh, recommendations to improve uh, the financial stability of the citizenship as such as uh, Joanne also mentioned to us. So um, I will move to the questions. We got also a few, uh, um, meanwhile, from the audience uh, and uh, would like to wrap up by the um, uh, recommendations to policymakers. Um, one question I got is uh, um, what, uh, so uh, with the full agreement that financial literacy needs to be tackled early, uh, what we can do to bridge the gap today, so how we can accelerate the financial literacy today. Who would like to take that? Uh, Ana Maria, maybe I give it to you? Yes, thank you very much. I think some countries are leading in this process, and I think uh, it is uh, important and urgent that we have financial literacy in school. And I would like to add it in, um, in courses on uh, citizenship. You know, I think we, we are all talking about, uh, you know, becoming better citizen today. 
And I think being part of being a good citizen is to understand the economy around you and also to understand the finance around you. So for example, Portugal made financial literacy mandatory already in 2018, and it is in the social in this uh, citizenship uh, course, and it is across the curriculum. So it's not that people feel like, oh, you know, now uh, we have to not teach other courses. So I, I think it is important in terms of socialization to start as early as possible. And I also think that if you haven't in the school, try to involve also the, uh, for example, parents and the community. It, there is this, uh, of course, important uh, African uh, say that it takes a village to teach a young person. And so as we all participate to this investment in financial education, we could all as well, for example, engage and learn from that process. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think um, the topic of addressing different uh, um, age groups is uh, evident. And it was mentioned also uh, from Andrea, who said that's uh, um, program for the young adults, 15 to 20 in Singapore. Joan mentioned the program for the already elder women who are out of the workforce and so on. So that is um, nicely uh, bounding to the next question to Sylvia. There is a question whether there is a, a differences or whether you have an evidence. There is a differences in terms of responses in different age groups, especially younger people on your studies. Sylvia? Yeah, yeah, I, I tried to unmute myself. Okay. Now it should work. Um, no, it's actually from what I can recall in the studies that I'm aware of that the response, um, there are no big dif uh, differences with regards to response um, uh, behavior in the sense that um, they all used to don't know option to the same extent as um, uh, younger women use them to the same extent and older women use them to uh, uh, the same extent. So what we really do see that once we actually take away the don't know option uh, as a response option, then we see actually the, 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 the women coming to the fore. But uh, other than that, we do not really see any differences. Thank you. So um, we can assume that uh, basically um, education, financial education and uh, democratic skills education is important on all stages of development. But the main message was to start early, engage the society, engage the family um, and try to have a comprehensive view here. Maybe I just go one by one because we are coming to the um, end of that uh, discussion. Um, I would like to come then one by one and just ask you which um, are the critical aspects and success factors to be considered in a national strategy as such. Uh, and just uh, to check, uh, in a, we get just one, what is the responsibility of the private versus public sector? Are there people outside of the financial system who can help? I think that fits very well together with the recommendation and success factors to a national strategy. So um, if I can start maybe um, from, um, yeah, from you, Joanne, because uh, you have started quite early in Singapore with that development. What is your opinion here? So I think that and one of the lessons that I am taking away from this panel really is that we really need to change the discourse of financial education from people thinking that it's something that economics and finance is a monopoly over. And I think reframing it more broadly as a citizenship construct and actually as a cultural construct is really important. And that means that we have to take inspiration from all of these other sectors. We know from the COVID pandemic today that a part of the reason that people don't comply with health measures is financial insecurity. So we now know that health and finance are intimately linked. We know that if people do not have secure retirements, this is the huge uh, fiscal threat for any country's government. So individual security is actually a matter of national defense. And a lot of the programming that we have taken lessons from actually is from the health sector. So we have learned how to do these programs about community behavioral change, actually looking at health programs from maternal and child health that have worked really well. 
And so when we change the discourse and we learn from other sectors, I think it's really powerful because what we want to do is create this culture of finance and a lifelong culture of, of learning about it and having it be something that we understand is, is not just the domain of, of economists, but really of everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Angelica, uh, your, your statement here, what do you think uh, are the critical aspect success factors and which is the responsibility of the public versus private sector here? Uh, I think one of the, the, the major success factor is, is pooling the resources and uh, cooperating and coordinating and not everybody going on, on its own path. I think that's that's one of the, the major success factors. And uh, as for uh, public responsibility versus private responsibility, I would think that uh, integrating uh, a financial education or be it in, in the form of citizenship education, as you just mentioned, I think it should always be seen in a broader, in a broader uh, way of life. Way of life. So it's, it's not just uh, one slice of the cake. Um, and I think that should be the, the public responsibility to, to incorporate it in the curricula of, uh, of the schools and then also engaging the, the private stakeholders to come in afterwards. And also, um, I think, um, empowering the teachers to do so because it's uh, it's also it's always uh, also very difficult for the teachers because they themselves have not probably not have uh, a lot of financial education at that point of time thank you um andrea may i turn back to you and uh, add also in addition to the question which are the critical aspects and success, success factors for a national strategy from your point of view, although uh, uh, we know that in Switzerland you didn't start it, I think, but still you have a, quite an evidence uh, of um, different economical perspectives. Uh, and there is also the question in um, the current uh, um, situation where we have so much of uh, information accessible on the internet and you have done the evaluation of uh, on online behavior and so on what are the critical success factors what do you think public authorities or national banks should do and what uh, should be taken care of by the private sector thank you very much uh, for these questions um Look, I'm going to I'm going to answer it from a central bank perspective. So 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 there is quite a bit that may, I agree. Ultimately, it's a holistic approach. What is important and all central banks have seen it is. One monetary policy matters. Price stability is a good is a, is a absolutely fundamental good for everybody, not just men, not, you know, for everybody in all age. But. Price stability can only be created if people understand what is happening. So financial literacy is really is very important for central banks, and it has become even more difficult. I don't need to tell you guys we are in a world with, with unconventional monetary policy. In Switzerland, we have negative interest rate. That's been very difficult to explain. We need to engage with people. What I have taken and I'd like to support from today's talk was very clearly this knowledge cannot just be taught in classrooms. You cannot just go into a class and we all know we go to one class and then what? Not for 20 years. It is, it must be part of a constant dialogue. It must be part, whether it's through speeches, through presentation, we need to engage with people. People need to be able to, to ask us questions. And ultimately, I believe all of us, we need to make it clear that these questions matter for everybody and we need to make it clear what the link is why should people why do want, why should people want to understand what central banks do because it matters because it is explainable and i think we need to do a better job at entering a dialogue we can do it from our perspective we've tried to do it with economics we will continue we've we've increased the, the amount of, of of communication where you know through websites through social media through videos, 
uh, what we do today, you know, nowadays central banks don't only talk in a scripted way. I think all of this matters ultimately it needs to go way beyond central banks. Of course, it needs to include the public sector and it needs to include the private sector, but it is about the dialogue. Inspiring. Um, Anna Maria, your last statement maybe from the uh, wonderful panel which you did last uh, Wednesday and experience from Portugal. What do you think are the critical success factors for national strategy here? Yes, thank you very much. I had the opportunity to interview the Minister of uh, Education in Portugal. But let me just say that, uh, repeating some of what the people said, you know, uh, financial literacy has to be part of it, the ecosystem. So we need, in a sense, to change the culture and we need to create a culture of financial knowledge that continues uh, over age and time. And it's very important that you bring many people together. And I wanted to tell to Andrea, in our financial education committee, we have the central bank, but we also have all of the regulator of the financial markets and, uh, and of, of insurance, by the way, and pensions. And we have uh, four ministry, not just uh, the Ministry of Finance and the Economy and the Ministry of Education, but also the Ministry of Economic Development and the Ministry of Labor. Just to say how much you need to bring to the table and how much you need that public, uh, also private partnership, because it's so important. And I think everyone can benefit now, for in particular now, from having a more informed, more financially literate population. I want to mention three initiatives as well that we have done to promote that discourse and that financial educational learning through time. We have a website which is dedicated to improving financial literacy for all. It is called Quello che conta in Italian, which is what matters, but it's also in plain words about counting. Um, and I hope it is uh, something that people can go to and, and get that, the, that basic information. We have also launched uh, October as Financial Education Month. So let's con let's elevate that discussion in the same way in which we have the you know breast cancer awareness month, which by the way is October. Um, you know we want to have an entire month dedicated to that, and our slogan is the month you uh, last all year long. But we have chosen October because you know it's the way it's the time where people are seeding where you are planting the seeds and we think of education as a plant that continues and we have done a lot of initiative also in the workplace and in small community so mayor as well can actually promote financial education in their own community thank you very much Thank you. Thank you, Ada Maria. Let me conclude on that panel. So I, I have personally learned uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, very interesting insights, but our conclusions being that the national strategy is extremely important. It's important to have a dialogue between all different uh, stakeholders and um, public stakeholders being different ministries, being national banks and other institutions, a very important promoter of that uh, um, financial uh, literacy national strategy. We should team up and keep the dialogue going on with all different uh, gender and uh, ages groups but also take care that that is a moderated online content, that there is a structured access for the citizenship to financial knowledge, and that there is um, thorough evaluation of the interventions which we do. So I'm very, very happy that uh, uh, we had that lively discussion today. I have to say from my side, from the Austrian National Bank, I'm happy to take this call and uh, um, on behalf of the Austrian National Bank, contribute and uh, uh, really uh, engage actively in the creation of a national strategy together with the other stakeholders. And I want to thank you all for your great participation, for your time, for valuable insights, and uh, we're welcome to follow up on this great conversation anytime later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very great. Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.